Hello everyone. It's been a while since we last gathered in my study for a few historic mystery stories. So make yourself comfortable. You can make yourself some tea or hot chocolate. Or if you prefer, you can listen eyes closed in the comfort of your bed. I have three different stories for you tonight. And there are timestamps to navigate between them on your screen and in the first comment pinned under this video. In the same first comment, you will find links to Spotify, Apple Music and other streaming services if you'd rather listen there. A link to my Patreon page too, if you wish to support this channel. And a link to an extended free trial of the Slumber app, where you can listen to many of my stories and more bedtime stories by other narrators and all sorts of sounds. It gives you the possibility to choose whatever background sounds you want to add to stories, from rain or wave sounds to quiet music, fireplace, or nothing at all if you prefer. So give it a try if you want. It is free for a month instead of seven days if you use the affiliate link which should give you enough time to decide whether you want to keep it or not. Okay now, let's dive into our stories. First, I'll take you to ancient Greece and a famous mysterious institution of the antiquity, the Oracle of Delphi. For many centuries, the Pythia, the high priestess of Apollo, delivered prophecies at this place in a state of trance or frenzy, and they were universally known and respected in the Greek world. What exactly happened for so long at Delphi? We'll try to examine this. Then I will tell you about a famous European myth of the Middle Ages, but that lasted long after changelings. The belief that babies or young children were stolen by fairies and replaced with copies or fakes that were not humans. But where did it come from and what lied beneath a myth like this one? And finally, we will relieve the extravagance of the court of the last Tsars of Russia, the Russian Revolution, and the fall of the reigning family, the Romanovs, through the story of Grand Duchess Anastasia Romanoyevna, the youngest daughter of the Tsar. During the revolution, the royal family was executed, and they were all thought to be dead, until several women claimed, starting in the 1920s, that they were the surviving daughter of the Tsar and one of them in particular appeared very convincing. Was it a lie, or did she really escape death? We'll find out, because thanks to DNA, this mystery that lasted for decades has now been solved beyond doubt. So, let's begin with our first story, The Oracle of Delphi. Maybe you already heard about the Pythia, sometimes called uh, the Pythoness, probably the most famous oracle of the antiquity. The Pythia was not a single person, but the name, the title given to a high priestess, 
the highest ranking priestess of god Apollo in Delphi. Little is known about how the priestess was chosen. It is likely that when the high priestess died, a new one was chosen among the various priestesses of the temple. Or she may have been chosen from an influential family, a woman with a good general education in politics, philosophy, history and the arts. It seems the rules changed over time, because in the later period, before this institution disappeared, the Pythia was chosen for her looks rather than her origins or education. But why was there a temple of Apollo in Delphi? Why were prophecies made? And what was it all about? To understand it, we need to go back in time to archaic Greece, more than 3000 years ago. Before classical Greece and the blooming of the Greek antique culture that we generally think about when we talk about ancient Greece, with its powerful city-states, its political systems, its philosophy, science and art, Long before that, there was the Mycenaean civilization. I told you a bit about it in various stories. Classical Greece, and later the conquests of Alexander the Great, this happened in the second half of the first millennium BC, the centuries before our era, before the expansion of Rome all around the Mediterranean Sea, including to the Greek world. But Greece had a distinctive civilization long before that. And the origins of this specific civilization, which was advanced for the time, they can be found in the late Bronze Age, before the introduction of iron, in the second millennium BC, more than a thousand years before classical Greece. This civilization is called Mycenaean, after an archaeological site in the south of Greece. The Mycenaeans were autochthonous Greeks and they came into contact with other Mediterranean cultures, especially from Crete, and I also told you about ancient Crete in the story about the Phaistos disc. I put a link in the description. These cultures influenced them and they developed a complex culture of their own. Complex in the sense that they used a writing system, they produced a large variety of crafts, they had political organizations centered on cities or at least big towns, from where rulers living in large palaces administered their zone of influence. This early period of ancient Greece, it left an important trace in the following millennium on society, religion and political systems. And I'm telling you all this because the oracle at Delphi was most probably established during the second millennium BC. Maybe by the middle of the millennium, we don't know exactly. There was a temple, but it would have been dedicated to Gaia, the Earth Goddess. And it is only much later, several centuries later, that priests of Apollo took over the temple and its oracle. Delphi was located in the middle of Greece, and it was not a city, but rather a sacred precinct with temples, monuments and shrines. By far, the most famous of these monuments was the Temple of Apollo and its oracle. We know next to nothing of how the oracle could work in the Mycenaean period, even though this lasted for centuries. But by the end of the second millennium, 
my salient culture declined. It was not the only one at the time. Across the Eastern Mediterranean, it has been observed that all civilizations had major setbacks at the same time. This phenomenon is called the Late Bronze Age Collapse, and the causes are not perfectly known. It could be wars, it could be climate, epidemics, or a combination of these. But as a result, these cultures all declined at the same time, and concretely it means that their cities lost inhabitants, and we observe a marked decline in standards of living over several decades, based on the production of crafts or buildings and the population may have shrank too. It took several generations to recover from it. And when Greece did, it laid the foundations of a new and brilliant culture. It is during this period that the Oracle of Delphi became internationally famous and an institution revered all across the Greek world. And why was this oracle particularly successful? Because there were others. Delphi had a central position in Greece, and the god Apollo was a very important deity. But maybe more importantly, the Pythia made her predictions in a state of frenzy. It was believed that when she spoke, the god was directly speaking through her. The specifics of the ritual are not perfectly known, I'll come back to that, but undeniably something uncommon happened in Delphi when the oracle was consulted. The Greeks had a word to describe her state when she made her predictions, enthusiasmos, from which the modern word enthusiasm comes from but the meaning of enthusiasmos was much stronger in ancient Greek. Enthusiasm refers to enjoyment, interest or approval. At most it is a mild exaltation. Enthusiasmos was a state of divine possession. It described something exceptional and extremely intense. The word has lost so much of its intensity that enthusiasmos is better translated as possession. Probably because of this extraordinary aspect, the fact that it was spectacular, due either to a real state of exaltation or showmanship, maybe, the oracle gained a lot of fame along the 7th century BC. And by the end of it, it had become famous all across Greece. Kings, nobles, warriors, they would all travel to Delphi to interrogate the Pythia and receive answers or guidance about the future. What happened exactly? It is not obvious because many authors talked about the oracle. Greeks, including Aristotle or Herodotus, the historian, and later Roman authors, but their accounts are elusive or sometimes contradictory. It seems the priestess took place on a tall tripod that stood above an opening in the ground, a kind of chasm from which vapors rose. So she was surrounded by these fumes and she entered a state of frenzy, of trance. And in this state, she spoke unintelligibly, but priests were here to uh, interpret the prophecies and write them down in verses. Now, other sources describe the priestess as speaking in her own voice, normally, and Herodotus said she spoke directly in verses. There is no consensus on what exactly happened, even though the state of possession of enthusiasmos 
is universally validated by others. And of course, the question is what caused this state of frenzy? One thinks immediately of the vapors coming from the ground. But it is worth noting that before prophecies were made, there was an entire procedure. First, the oracle of Apollo only functioned nine months per year, from spring to autumn. During the winter, Apollo was said to have deserted his temple, and his cult was replaced by the cult of his half-brother, Dionysus. During the month of operation, the oracle made prophecies only once a month, one day a month. And before that, the priestess went through elaborate rituals of purification, including fasting and praying. On the seventh day of the month, her face was veiled in purple, and she was guided by two priests who took her to a spring near Delphi, where she bathed, and then she drank holy water from another spring near the temple, where a naiad, a female spirit of streams and wells, was said to live. There are various accounts of the purification ceremony that took place in the temple. Euripides, who was a tragedian from Athens, said that the floor was sprinkled with holy water. And meanwhile, the consultants, the people who had come to the oracle to receive its messages, approached the temple carrying laurel branches. Laurel was a symbol of Apollo. They also carried a monetary fee an offering, and a young goat that would be sacrificed in the forecourt of the temple as an offering to the god. The goat was sacrificed, its organs were examined to check whether the signs were favorable, and then they were burned. The rising smoke was a signal that the oracle was now open. The high priestess removed her veil, and she appeared in a plain white dress. She seated on her tripod seat, and predictions began to be made. Typically there were several consultants during the day. They were introduced in an order determined by the importance of their donation to the temple, or their political importance as individuals. Representatives of city-states often came to ask what the omens were about all sorts of decisions, going to war, founding a colony, sending an expedition, receiving an embassy or signing a treaty. For centuries it was often unthinkable in large Greek cities like Sparta, Thebes or Athens to take a big decision without at least consulting the oracle. The question that had been prepared and formulated beforehand, with help from the priests, was presented to the oracle, and she spoke, either unintelligibly, and priests would uh, tell the consultants the meaning of her message, or directly, we don't really know. But all accounts insist that there was something frantic and otherworldly in the experience. And the faith in the validity of the oracle was apparently almost never questioned, at least based on the documents, the accounts we have. The prophecies were not just intended to be visions of the future. Oracles were meant to give advice, to shape future actions. It was a form of guidance. So, as guidance, did it work? It's hard to tell, 
Typically, in Greek tales and legends, like the story of the Trojan War, prophecies are accurate. But this is not surprising. These are stories, and you probably noticed that in uh, every movie or every novel, when there is a prophecy as a plot device, it's always right, otherwise it wouldn't be mentioned. In the real world, the oracle was always somewhat hard to understand. It was always cryptic and subject to interpretation. So in the many cases when individuals or Greek cities took decisions following the oracle's guidance and failed completely, you can never prove whether the oracle just delivered useless messages or whether it was misunderstood. But what is beyond doubt is this state of possession, of enthusiasmos, in which the Pythia delivered her prophecies. So what could have happened? The simplest and uh, most basic explanation could be that it was all a show, and the Pythia was instructed to produce her oracles looking a bit deranged. It could be showmanship, technically, but the Greeks were not particularly naive, and they did believe that something supernatural happened at Delphi. And also, the secret of this scam would have had to be passed for generations, centuries even, without anyone coming forward to reveal that it was just a scam. As far as we know, no one is ever mentioned in antique texts saying that the oracle was just a show. And people donated a lot of money to receive this guidance. So if it was something else than just a show, then there was the existence of this chasm and the vapors that rose out of it. So a second group of possibly scientific explanations centers on these vapors. What if they were hallucinogenic gases? There are hydrocarbons like ethylene, or benzene, or methane, that can have these properties, and that can also be released from a geologic chasm. Some researchers have argued that a chasm in the ground could have been a seismic ground rupture. It is possible, but it cannot be verified, because the chasm has disappeared. More precisely, excavations made at Delphi found a lot of possible small fissures, but they could not exactly locate one above which the priestess would have seated. But there is evidence of a fault line passing under Delphi, and there are underground deposits from which hydrocarbons could be liberated. Or maybe there were hallucinations that had another cause. We know that before the oracle session, the Pythia went through a long preparation, and the details of these rituals are not precisely known. Another theory, then, is that before sitting on her tripod and answering questions, the Pythia used a plant called oleander, including chewing its leaves and uh, inhaling their smoke. Oleander is toxic and has been considered a poisonous plant for a long time around the Mediterranean, where it grows. Ingestion causes nausea, irregular heart rhythm, the sap may cause irritations of the skin, and if the priestess did chew leaves and breathe smoke from oleander, it could have caused symptoms similar to those of epilepsy. An aspect that is seducing in this theory is not just that it could work scientifically, but also that in the antiquity, the Greeks and later the Romans 
considered epilepsy to be almost a sacred disease. People who had a fit of epilepsy were believed to be in contact with another world, or the gods, and this is just what was believed of the oracle when she made her prophecies. And maybe these vapors that rose from the chasm actually came from an underground space dug under the temple, where oleander or another plant would have been burnt by priests. In that case, the oracle could have had hallucinations, but intentionally caused, and that would actually fit an archaeological discovery made at Delphi. There was indeed an underground room under the temple, but there is no proof that it communicated with the room where prophecies were made, or that priests ever burnt plants to cause them. This is speculative. In any case, hallucinations or not, natural phenomenon or provoked by man, the oracle of Apollo functioned for more than a thousand years. It remained in operation and was still famous under the Roman Empire, and it was abandoned only in the late 4th century AD. Christianity had spread to the entire empire and become the religion of emperors. In 390 AD, the ruling emperor Theodosius I ordered the destruction of the temple as a part of a policy to remove all traces of paganism, and the oracle was silenced. It was already a mystery in the antiquity, and with the destruction of the temple, it disappeared with its secrets, probably forever. Now, let's talk about a second story. And for this one, we leave the antiquity and advance by several centuries. You probably heard the term changeling before, but what does it mean and where does it come from? Again, we need to talk about history and folklore to find out. And this will take us across Europe, where the same myth, with slight variations, used to be known in many countries. Historically, a changeling was referred to in English as an oaf. In modern language, an oaf is a stupid or clumsy person, and the meanings are connected, as we're going to see. The term oaf comes from the Middle English elven, which itself came from the Old Norse term for elf, alfr. And indeed, there is a connection to ancient beliefs about elves, trolls and fairies. A changeling, or an oaf, was believed to be a, a human-like creature, often a fairy that had been left in place of a human baby. Fairies or other creatures would have stolen a newborn and replaced it with a fake having the same appearance but of a completely different nature, a nature that would appear later when the child would grow up. This sounds bizarre but this was taken very seriously for centuries and it provided an explanation for when children grew up different from others, either physically or mentally. Typically, people believed that a baby could be stolen by fairies and replaced when the parents were not watching. But it was not always fairies. In Scandinavia, it was generally believed that it was trolls. The trolls from Scandinavian folklore were not always thought to be these 
big humanoid monsters from modern fantasy, even though they inspired them. They were always dangerous to human beings, but depending on the sources, their appearance varied a lot, from ugly and rather stupid to exactly like human beings except they always lived separated from humanity, dwelling in mountains or caves. And in the transition from Old Norse mythology to folklore, they changed a lot. The belief that they had to live in the dark because sunlight frightened them or even could turn them into stone appeared. They were sometimes described as man-eaters and depending on the regions and countries of Scandinavia they came in a variety of sizes in some cases giants, in others dwarves sometimes they lived in small family units, sometimes solitary but clearly they always represented a mysterious threat that people could not see they were not necessarily evil, but they were always dangerous for humans. In Eastern Europe, especially in Poland, it was not fairies or trolls, but malevolent female spirits like the Mamuna. These creatures came from Slavic mythology. They were known for living in swamps and being dangerous and they were previously women who lived a bit at the margin of society, like unmarried mothers, old maids or midwives, and they would have turned into these demons after death. In Germany, in Great Britain, Ireland or France, they were fairies. But fairies from European folklore could be quite far from the modern image of fairies. The word today is generally positive and in popular culture a fairy is a tiny woman with wings who is often kind and benevolent. At least it is a creature that we are invited to be amazed at, not afraid of. But this is the 19th and 20th century version of fairies because they used to be much more ambivalent and not cute at all in the previous centuries. Depending on local medieval folklores or traditions, fairies were either ancient pagan deities that were still lurking despite the installation of Christianity or even they could be fallen angels, demons, or spirits of the dead, and sometimes spirits of nature. They always had supernatural powers, and you didn't want to cross their path, because they were always seen as tricksters, and often as mean, or at least dangerous. They were often blamed for sickness and birth deformities and people would protect from them with charms like church bells that were believed to make them go away and some types of food or a four-leaf clover. So it's only when people massively stopped believing in these supernatural creatures in the 18th and 19th centuries that they started to be represented as cute and marvelous. The Celtic revival in the 19th century that actualized in a positive light the Celtic heritage also rehabilitated them. Fairies became popular during the Victorian era and it is this representation that still lives on in popular culture. But in fact, in the previous centuries, fairies played the same role as trolls in Scandinavia 
and then defined menace from creatures that were not necessarily actively malicious all the time, but were not our friends at all. And maybe because this belief in fairies was well established in Celtic folklore, the myth of changelings was particularly present in Scotland, in parts of England, Ireland, in the west of France, like in Brittany. So what was the fairies or trolls supposed motivation in changing babies? There were several theories. In Scandinavia, it was believed that trolls liked to have their own kind raised by humans. Elsewhere, it was supposed that traits in newborns that were seen as beautiful, like blonde hair or blue eyes, these attracted fairies because they wanted to appropriate these traits. Yet another legend was that fairy children needed human milk to survive and grow. In another version of the myth, changelings were old fairies who were placed in human families with a human appearance so that they would be taken care of. But why did this legend emerge and become so widespread? Some folklorists believe, even though it is not documented, that there could be a base of truth in it. Not in the sense that actual fairies exchanged babies, but babies were exchanged by other people. When this myth formed, Europe was still subject to waves of invasion and then Christianization. So some groups of people may have gone into hiding or at least living at the margin of the rest of society because they rejected assimilation or because they were rejected. Part of the fear of witches may have the same origin, women who lived at the margin, isolated from larger communities. And these people may have in fact exchanged their own children when they were sick for the healthy children of the occupying invaders. So there could have been substitutions like this in many regions that would have given birth to the legend. And of course, another possibility is that changelings explained abnormal development in children. It was not systematic, but often changelings were believed to reveal their true nature growing up. They would develop deformities like fairies, trolls or demons or were unable to speak and behave in a way seen as normal. There could have been a variety of medical conditions that were not understood back then, and probably many cases of mental illnesses or autism that were attributed to fairies. It was not systematic, mental or development troubles that were called madness in medieval or modern times, were only sometimes attributed to changelings, and the belief was more rooted in remote villages or hamlets than in towns. And so, as means of protection against an exchange, there were a lot of different measures parents, especially mothers, were invited to take like placing a piece of iron, scissors for example, near the baby, because it was believed that fairies and trolls were afraid of iron, or placing a crucifix near newborns, baptizing them as soon as possible, and of course always keep an eye on them. It may sound naive, but in medieval Europe, Living conditions were really precarious. 
there were famines regularly, and the wealth of a peasant household was the quantity of arms available to work. A disabled child that would turn into an adult who couldn't be married and would not produce food, but would have to be taken care of. This was a little disaster for the family, to the point of threatening the other members. So it was cruel, but children suspected of being changelings could be abandoned, or sometimes beaten, or exposed to water and fire, because it was believed that it would force them to admit their real nature. And so there may have been a kind of psychological function of uh, the myth of changelings beyond the belief. It was also maybe a pretext, a reason to get rid of children in a way that could be justified and did not affect people's conscience too much. This could be a social and psychological dimension to the myth. And that would explain why it lasted well after the Middle Ages, until the 19th century. And here there was a famous case that happened in Ireland in 1895. A woman, her name was Bridget Cleary, was killed by her husband and members of the family, who accused her of being a changeling. That was just 125 years ago. But rural Ireland, in the late 19th century, still lived almost like two or three centuries earlier. The country was really poor at the time, and except for a few manufactured products in homes, remote counties in Ireland had completely stayed out of the Industrial Revolution. And this incident happened in Central Ireland, in Clonmel, a town of County Tipperary. Bridget was born in 1869, and aged 18, she married Michael Cleary, a cooper. She had a degree of independence, and became almost a professional in the years following her marriage, which was unusual at the time and in this location. She had a little flock of chickens, and she sold eggs. She also owned a sewing machine, and she made dresses that she also sold. It is hard to know the exact state of the relationship with her husband. At the beginning of their marriage, she went to live with her elderly parents, and they didn't live together. It didn't mean they were formally separated, but they were both very young and not ready yet to establish a home together. But after a few years, they could finally settle and live in a quite good-looking house in Clonmel. But interesting detail, the house had a slightly suspicious reputation because it was built on the site of a supposed fairy ring fort, that is to say the remains of a prehistoric dwelling or stone circle, and these remains were believed to be fairy circles. In March 1895, Bridget fell ill, and after more than a week of what could have been bronchitis, a physician visited her. She was very sick, so much that a priest was called to administrate last rites out of precaution. Over the following two days, it seems not only her husband, but also several friends and family members, including her father, became absolutely convinced that she was not just sick, but possessed, or that she was no longer herself. They submitted her to treatment or rites 
that were supposed to cast the fairy out of her, like carrying her before the fireplace. You remember it was believed that changelings had to admit their true nature when exposed to fire. In the following days, rumors began to circulate that Bridget was missing. The local police began searching for her, and her husband claimed that she had been taken by fairies. Soon after, her body was found in a shallow grave, and the coroner who examined the body declared that she had died by burning. Nine people were charged for what was investigated as a murder, including her husband, Michael. Five of them were indicted by a jury on charges of wounding, and a trial took place. It appeared during the trial that this was not a case of her husband trying to hide the murder of his wife behind a, a pretext like a legend. He had been convinced that she was a changeling and no longer Bridget. And not just him, but several other family members who had participated in the mistreatment. Their defense line was that they had a genuine belief that she was not herself. They didn't intend to kill her, but rather to restore her to her rightful self. This could possibly have been admitted in a trial two or three hundred years earlier, but in 1895 this was just not accepted as justification. In a sense there were two views of the world in opposition but a woman had died, and her husband spent 15 years in jail. Authors have later speculated that there might have been a psychotic disorder from Michael Cleary, due to the stress of managing Bridget's illness, and somehow he would have convinced others on a terrain of superstition that was favorable. Maybe the psychological and social mechanism here was similar to what happened sometimes when there were witch hunts. We don't know. But it is striking that suddenly almost 10 people who knew this woman very well were suddenly absolutely sure that she was no longer herself. Now for our third story of the night. We are going to move to Russia a century ago, at the time of the Russian Revolution, and I'll tell you about the life of Grand Duchess Anastasia Nikolaevna of Russia, and the question of her possible survival. As you probably know, the last Tsar of Russia was Nicholas II. During the Russian Revolution, Nicholas II abdicated. He didn't really have a choice. His power had vanished, and his family had been placed under house arrest at Tsarkoye Selo, the summer palace of the Tsars, near St. Petersburg. As a second revolution was taking place, and the Bolsheviks were advancing, the government sent the family to Siberia, so that they wouldn't fall in the hands of the Bolsheviks. But in a few months, the Bolsheviks seized control of a large part of Russia, and the royals became their prisoners. They were moved again to the city of Yekaterinburg, and this captivity that lasted for months was very uncertain and for the children of the Tsar and the Tsarina, who had always lived in luxury and without major concerns, it was probably very destabilizing. The fall was spectacular. Anastasia was born in 1901. 
She was only 16 when the revolution happened. And she was the last, the youngest of four daughters. In total, the Tsar and the Tsarina had had five children. The only boy, the Tsarevich, was born after Anastasia. The royal daughters were called Grand Duchess, that was Anastasia's title. And before the revolution, the lives of these children were like no other in Russia. They were very protected. They had little connection with their country. They stayed between different palaces, especially the Winter Palace in the heart of St. Petersburg and the Summer Palace in Tsarkoye Selo. They were surrounded with dozens of servants, private instructors, maids, and the only other children they could see were from the highest nobility. They were constantly watched and taken care of. There was discipline, but they lived in a world of luxury and abundance that probably no other royal family enjoyed at the time. Other European monarchies also had palaces and servants, of course, but their powers were limited and their residences were not as over the top as the Romanovs. And this bubble formed by the royal court was completely separated from the country, where the ordinary man was still poor and knew very little of the rest of the world. In contrast, the Russian court was rather international, and actually since the 18th century, its members spoke more German and French than Russian. They learned Russian because they had to, but empresses were chosen among German princesses, and the children were educated in French and English. They knew that there was poverty and suffering in Russia, because they were told, and they had to show themselves in charities or visit hospitals in case of war to show solidarity. But that was very conceptual when your surroundings and your entire life is made of comfort, lavish interiors and rooms full of toys. So, when the revolution began, and the family was made prisoner, their world completely collapsed. Their captivity lasted for a month, until in July 1918, when a group of Bolsheviks in Yekaterinburg executed them. At the time, Russia was descending into a civil war between the Bolsheviks and their Red Army on the communist side and the royalists, the whites, who had several previously Tsarist armies. Eliminating the Romanovs was at the same time a precaution to make sure that they would not be recaptured by their partisans and it was also psychological warfare intended to demobilize the counter-revolutionaries. There was no longer a Tsar to put back on the throne since Nicholas II and his only son were dead. The world was shocked. Executions of monarchs are uncommon, but it was assumed that the entire family was dead. Anastasia and her sisters, Olga, Tatiana and Maria would be remembered as young women who never really had a chance to express a personality or leave a trace, victims of tragic circumstances that they could not influence. And indeed, there are not many things to say about her three older sisters, but Anastasia would not be forgotten that easily because in a matter of a month after her death, very quickly, several young women began to claim to be her, and most of them, including the most famous one, Anna Anderson, insisted for decades 
that they were Anastasia. They had their supporters and uh, sometimes witnesses confirming their claims. And the mystery lasted for decades. Was Anastasia really dead? So why these claims and how credible were they? First, it's interesting to notice that Russia is no stranger to these kind of claims. Going back centuries, the country has a long tradition of impostors who claimed to be officially dead princes, rightful heirs to the throne, generally for political reasons, to challenge the power of the Tsars. Many revolts led by impostors were repressed, and the most famous was a peasant uprising at the time of Catherine II, Catherine the Great, in the 18th century, led by Pugachev, a man who claimed to be the rightful emperor, Peter III. And second, the execution of the family had taken place behind closed doors. It served the interests of the Bolsheviks, and there was no direct, unrefutable proof accessible to the public. You had to believe the Bolsheviks, and no one had access to evidence. Plus, it was during a civil war. You couldn't be sure of anything. And when someone came forward, claiming to be a, a surviving member of the family of the Romanovs, you had no argument to oppose because no one could know for sure what had happened to them. What if the Bolsheviks had left one or several daughters escape? What if Anastasia had feigned a death and managed to go into hiding with the help of someone, maybe? Why not? Actually, for every child of the family, there were several claimants, the Grand Duchesses, the Tsarevich. And it is in this troubled context that several women came forward from 1920 claiming that they were Anastasia. Two of them, who claimed to be Anastasia and her sister, Maria, were taken in by a priest in the Ural Mountains, not far from Yekaterinburg, in 1919. They became nuns and they kept claiming until their death in 1964, long after, that they were the daughters of the fallen Tsar. Another claimant was Eugenia Smith. She was born Evgenia Smetisko in Austria-Hungary, probably two years before Anastasia, and she moved to America, where she changed her name to Eugenia Smith. She defended her supposed identity for decades. She went as far as writing an autobiography, retelling her supposed life at the court in St. Petersburg. But for reasons that I will come back to at the end, we now know that it was entirely invented. But maybe she ended up believing her story. Her main rival was Anna Anderson, probably the most famous claimant of them all. And uh, obviously people who were interested in this mystery had to pick a side between the two. There was an anecdote that took place in 1963 at a publishing house. The publishing house had been contacted by a former Polish army officer who claimed to be the Tsarevich Alexei, the young brother of Anastasia but he was also an imposter. And a meeting was organized between this Polish claimant and Eugenia Smith, two strangers who had absolutely never ever met before. But when they met, they embraced each other, they cried and they affirmed each other's identity. Two years later, they had a falling out and Eugenia Smith denounced him as a fraud. She certainly knew what she was talking about. Another example, but this time in Russia, was Nadezhda Vasilyeva. 
she surfaced in Siberia in 1920 as she was trying to travel from Russia to China. Traveling abroad was forbidden, and the Bolsheviks captured her, suspecting that she could be a spy, and she was imprisoned for a long time in uh, Moscow and Leningrad, the new name of St. Petersburg, and then on an island in the White Sea, north of Russia, before being moved to various mental institutions. She sent letters in French and German to King George V of the United Kingdom, asking him to help his cousin Anastasia. There was never any response, and decades passed. At some point she changed her claim, saying that she was the daughter of a merchant from Riga, before returning to her initial claim that she was Anastasia. She died in 1971 in an asylum. We also know that she was certainly not telling the truth, but her origins are uncertain. And given that she had education, she spoke foreign languages, it is well possible that she came from a wealthy family, maybe aristocratic, there is no way to know and that her real family had lost everything and be dispersed in the turmoil of the revolution, maybe. But the star of all Anastasias was Anna Anderson. She may not have been Anastasia, but she did have an extraordinary life, and her known story began in 1920 in Berlin, Germany. 18 months after the execution of the Romanovs. On this winter day, a young woman attempted to commit suicide by uh, jumping off a bridge in Berlin. She was rescued by the police and placed in a hospital. She had no papers. She refused to give her identity and according to the staff, she spoke German with a Russian accent. For the next two years, she stayed at a mental hospital, and as it happened, a fellow psychiatric patient claimed that she was Grand Duchess Tatiana, a sister of Anastasia, and a few émigrés from Russia, not very close from the palace in St. Petersburg, visited her and believed her. But Anna Anderson, who still had never given an identity, didn't say nor claim anything. Visitors of the alleged Tatiana believed that they may have found Anastasia too, and so she was taken out of the asylum and given a room in the Berlin home of a Russian émigré. An aristocrat who lived in Poland before the revolution. Either he believed her to be Anastasia and wanted to help, or he had other motives in keeping an alleged Grand Duchess. In 1922, the civil war was already lost by counter revolutionaries, but outside Russia, all hope of restoration of Tsardom had not been entirely lost. This mysterious woman began to call herself Anna Tchaikovsky. Anna is a short form of Anastasia. And there was a police investigation to determine whether she was Anastasia Romanov, but it was inconclusive. Over time, she had embraced the claim and now said that she was Anastasia. A few years passed. She fell ill and was visited by several members of the court who had escaped Russia because she had become famous in Russian circles in Western Europe. These visitors included the ex-groom of the chamber of the Tsarina, the French tutor of Anastasia in St. Petersburg, the Tsar's sister, all people who had met her many times before the revolution. Eventually, they all denied she was Anastasia. 
they just didn't recognize her. But the community of Russians in exile became split over her case. Others believed her or expressed doubt. And she became by far the most famous and serious claimant to be Anastasia by the mid-1920s. The defunct Tsarina was from a German aristocratic family, the Dukes of Hesse, and the Grand Duke would have been Anastasia's uncle if she were still alive. So he funded a private investigation, and the investigation identified her as a Polish worker, a factory worker, with a history of mental illness. A long lawsuit began, which made her case move to the mainstream. She became famous, well beyond Russian communities, and through media coverage, she gained more supporters, people who were not necessarily connected to the Romanovs, nor Russians, but who were touched or excited by her claim. For Anna, a strange life began and lasted almost 50 years. She lived between Germany and the USA, alternatively between the homes of various supporters and nursing homes, including once an asylum. She finally officially emigrated to America in 1968 and married a history professor from Charlottesville, Virginia, who totally believed her case. She died in 1984, with still hundreds of supporters around the world and several books written about her. Independent investigators tried everything, from looking at the shape of her ear and comparing it to Anastasia's on photos, to making witnesses meet her. It was never really conclusive. She didn't have much to support her claim, but enough people who had lived in or visited the palaces before the revolution expressed doubt, and that kept her case alive. When she died in 1984, it seemed the mystery of Anna Anderson and Anastasia would remain unexplained forever. But it didn't. Because after the fall of the Soviet Union, the location of the bodies of the Tsar, the Tsarina, and all their children, the five of them, were revealed. Remains were found, and they could be tested for DNA in various countries and laboratories. They all came to the exact same conclusions. Each child was identified individually in the remains, including Anastasia. She had died in 1918 with the rest of the family. Her body was here to prove it, and all claimants were either lying or deluded. Anna Anderson's DNA was also tested from a lock of her hair. These tests did not exist yet when she died, and it revealed that she had no connection whatsoever with the Romanovs. It had been a fantasy all along for her and all other claimants. This is the end of our stories for tonight. But if you like these mystery stories, I have many more on my channel on Spotify or Patreon. I put links in the description. For now, it's time to quietly fall asleep. can listen to soft fireplace sounds for a little while if you wish to. Sleep well. Sweet dreams. <laughs>